stakeholders on the social because of the legal bindings that you have. Hence, the content has to be largely very serious. So how do we manage reputation for healthcare sector? Uh, if you look at uh, traditionally, uh, this sector has been using print and electronic media. We've been using mainline publications and magazines, paid advertisements, sponsorship of events, and word of mouth uh, advertising and brand uh, promotion, etc. But today, the pharma and the healthcare sector has started using the digital media also to a great extent. And we realize that in, when you're using the new age uh, digital media platforms, your content has to be very, very strong and effective, and your timing is very, very critical. So thus, you've seen the emergence of platforms like blogs, like forums, social media platforms that I touched upon earlier, various other online platforms, which give you an opportunity to engage with your critical stakeholders. So what are the kind of successful healthcare brands who've been utilizing or leveraging social media very effectively? In the area of healthcare services, the kind of quick names that come to my mind is Practo, Portia, Thyrocare, or other diagnostic services, because as I said earlier, it gives you the opportunity to engage with communication which is targeted at your users, which is a B2C environment, which allows you to kind of uh, use these platforms for, for business leads, etc., and which is why you also see that these kind of players are able to spend a lot of money because there it, the, the, the digital promotion is happening for business purpose. But pharma, in contrast, is very, very different. So uh, you heard me say that pharma is a highly regulated sector. Now, what is this pharma regulation that we are talking about? Uh, the uh, pharma sector is still controlled by an age-old Drugs and Cosmetics Act, which came in 1940, before independence, and Magic Remedies Advertising Act of 1954. So that's the kind of uh, legal regulation which is uh, binding the pharma companies, and obviously it poses a lot of challenges. There are certain social media guidelines which are coming up, but they are still not very clear, they're a little ambiguous. So all the brands who are on the social are a little cautious in their approach because you do not want to go wrong and you do not want to get into any legal hassles. At the same time, I mean, it's not just the regulation which holds us back, but I think the inherent, uh, you know, the, the, the intrinsic uh, quality or what this business is all about, the, the products which are highly sensitive and health-related, that also kind of holds us back because uh, the, uh, the risk associated with the product and communication related to product is extremely high. So which is the, uh, to talking about the diverse stakeholder group that uh, we all engage on using the digital platforms is doctors, patients, your partners, clients, and investors. Engaging with these uh, diverse stakeholders uh, is a challenge in itself because, as I said, each one of them has a different dynamics altogether, which is probably the fact that reason why pharma today, if you look at, is still very much engaging with their key stakeholders, doctors, and KOLs through very traditional medium. We do see penetration of digital coming in, but that it's still very less. But what is really but what has really taken off, um, what has really kind of been accepted well is the use of mobile technology. And this use of mobile technology has actually enabled us to develop these very, very specific mobile apps which are targeted at doctors and patients and regulators, etc. More on that uh, later. Um, through this slide, I'm trying to quickly showcase uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, pharma, the pharma digital footprint, if you look at the leaders, how they are. Um, at Biocon, we are very passionate about what we do through social because uh, we believe that gives us an opportunity to engage with our stakeholders in real time. It gives us the opportunity to correct perceptions where there are issues which are, which are mongering up. It also kind of gives us an opportunity to project ourselves as thought leader and the leader and, and a caring and compassionate brand. So uh, keeping all that in mind, you will see that Biocon has a presence across Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. But what is interesting here is to note that um, Dr. Reddy's is really ahead of the pack, if you look at you know, the number of followers that it has on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, as well as LinkedIn. The only place where they're really not doing well is YouTube. Um, and when it comes to, um, when it comes to Biocon, if you look at, uh, we, we are very active on Facebook and uh, we do almost uh, 
10 updates a week there. Uh, we are very active on Twitter as well. Even on the video, we use that, that platform very effectively to upload video messages because as you know, today, it's in today's era, video content is really very, very popular with the audiences. But what is interesting is to note that there are still a lot of companies, if you look at Sun Pharma, which is the largest pharma company of India, it has a very, very low footprint on the digi digital. Similarly, if you look at uh, Lupin and Aurobindo Pharma, Lupin is not even there on YouTube, while Aurobindo Pharma doesn't believe in Twitter. So, so the, the landscape in the pharma is still evolving. There are certain progressive um, you know, brands which have taken the risk and taken the lead to leverage this uh, media, but there are others who have yet to follow. So going back to what I said earlier on, that what we have really seen in the pharma and healthcare sector is the use of technology. And this technology has kind of helped us in terms of engaging with the patients and caregivers in a much more effective manner because we know that we cannot promote products on uh, using uh, traditional or digital media, we engage in telling interesting stories about the brand which are targeted at specific uh, stakeholders. And we believe that it is very, very important to build reputation through relationship building. And for that, we, we prefer to engage with doctors, we prefer to engage with our investors, and uh, we prefer to engage with the regulators. So what is the journal pharma companies doing today on the digital? They are actually trying to take thought leadership position. They are engaging with KOLs. They're also trying to get connected to patients through patient-centric uh, uh, messaging and communication that happens. And uh, we are, uh, and, and, and employer branding is again very important and um, uh, reason why we are on the social. So I mentioned to you about the use of uh, technology for creating apps. That's, that slide shows you a bit uh, on the kind of apps which are being developed for diverse stakeholders. Uh, for instance, Dr. Reddy's has a very specific mobile app that is targeted at uh, suppliers. So it, it is there to kind of make your supply chain very efficient because we all know uh, life-saving drugs and you cannot go wrong there. So their app is called Vikreta Mobile. Vikreta in Hindi, uh, um, it's a Hindi word, so in English it means a, a seller. Uh, similarly, uh, Sipla has another app which is actually targeted at doctors where they are helping them in terms of managing their calendars effectively. Uh, Biocon has a whole lot of uh, apps as well, but the one that we're talking about here is GERDQ, GERD -Q, which is actually helping doctors to assess what is the risk of the patient to develop GERD and you know, how it can be avoided. Um, uh, quickly, I know I've been told five minutes, so I would take you through uh, the Biocon case study in terms of what we do and how we do. So um, going back to what I mentioned earlier on, we engage with diverse stakeholders using digital and social media, uh, doctors, patients, employees, community, and investors. And I spoke about pharma being highly regulated, which poses a lot of challenges to communication. So how Biocon is addressing this challenge is uh, we're using the digital uh, for CRM platforms for doctors, online communication through which we engage with doctors. We hold webinars, we use mobile apps, and when it uh, coming to social media, how we're really using social media, we're not really doing product promotion at all, but rather what we do is we focus on creating public awareness on various diseases. Um, we believe in knowledge sharing on industry-related issues. We're doing a lot of advocacy also using the digital platforms because we believe uh, by shaping opinions, we can create awareness which can actually help in terms of uh, the enabling different policies that are important for the country. Uh, we also do employee engagement and health management uh, guidance and a lot of cause-related campaigns that we do. Uh, this slide tells you about the Biocon uh, digital engagement footprint. If you look at, uh, I would want to talk to you about Bioconversations, which is a Biocon blog, which we use very effectively to express views and opinions on the latest scientific developments that are happening, not just about Biocon, but also what's happening globally. The, um, the company's leadership team likes to engage, and uh, we, we, we share our opinions with the general public on this uh, platform, and there is about one post per month that we do. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, we are very active on Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, as well as um, uh, Kiran uh, herself all has a separate blog. But what I must mention here is uh, a bit on the LinkedIn. 
right? So as I mentioned, LinkedIn is essentially a platform which is for professional networks, uh, for networking with professionals. It is very, very critical for the pharma companies to utilize this uh, platform effectively because um, it gives you the opportunity to uh, create communities, to create close groups where you can actually have meaningful discussions which sometimes are difficult to have on the other platforms because Twitter has a limited uh, 140 character messaging and you need to be very, very effective to be able to use Twitter effectively. Facebook is more like, uh, more like an album where you're talking about what you're doing in your life. But if you're really, really serious about serious conversations, exchange of opinion, discussing issues, then LinkedIn is the platform for you. And um, I am happy to share with you that not only we engage with our stakeholders on LinkedIn, but we also use that very effectively to hire people. So all potential employees, in fact, uh, more than 30% of our hiring happens through LinkedIn. Because, uh, uh, because uh, especially when you're hiring uh, middle, middle and senior executives, nobody would want to go to you know, uh, the so-called job search portals, right? So, the, the, and, and, uh, so, so through LinkedIn, they feel more comfortable because they don't want to go through the search forms either. And uh, so if you are putting up those kind of positions on LinkedIn, you get a much better response, quicker response, and cost-effective uh, modes of uh, hiring. Um, quickly, a few more slides on some of the work that we do because uh, Ruchi had asked me to take you through some of the campaigns. I'll try to be uh, quick. Uh, Ruchi, do I have time to move forward? Another five minutes? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, talking about campaigns and the digital event promotions that we do, uh, mobile apps I referred to earlier on. Um, so that tells you about the kind of uh, apps that we've developed. Diabetes is, is, is an app which has been developed targeted at the doctors where uh, we help them in terms of managing the disease for their patients effectively. A lot of uh, patient support data goes onto that. And it also has the capability of reporting any adverse event and uh, et cetera, et cetera. GERDQ is a tool uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that, which helps you in terms of analyzing the symptoms that your patients are showing, which tells you what is the risk and what is the, you know, the, it also allows you to measure the intensity of the health issue that uh, the patient may have. Uh, Level Next is another mobile application which is used by nephrologists, again, for transplant patients. SoCal is, again, is, is, a, is, an, is a latest, uh, you know, the next generation app which has been developed. Uh, for the use by physicians because we realize that uh, psoriasis is a disease which is like a social stigma. People don't want to talk about it. And uh, Biocon has a novel um, uh, product for uh, psoriasis. So um, I'm bringing that up here so that you understand that, you know, within the challenging environment that you have, how do you really communicate and you still do not talk about your product, but you reach out to the patients and the doctors, lending a helping hand and telling them that, okay, we are here as thought leaders and we are here to help you manage that disease better, where we have a better understanding of the disease, managing that disease, and also probable solutions to cure that disease. So SoCal is, is, is one such uh, app uh, that we have. Uh, I already spoke about bioconversation, how we use that blog very effectively to engage with our diverse stakeholders by expressing opinion and views on our diverse subjects. We also, um, uh, I think I'll quickly move on to investor engagement because it's important for you to understand that a digital platform is not just to engage with your friends. It can actually be used for business purpose, which is why you know, I'm taking you through this. So what we have been doing is we've been doing very powerful storytelling using, uh, um, using various uh, digital platforms targeted at the investor community. As you all know, uh, Biocon is the, uh, is the first and the largest publicly listed biotech organization. And today we have scaled up and 70% of our revenues come from global markets, which has also led us uh, to you know, being recognized as Asia's leading biopharmaceutical organization. But more importantly, uh, our business model is highly differentiated, which is kind of, uh, you know, uh, which kind of, um, you know, makes it very necessary for us to reach out to the investors using digital, where we showcase the key differentiations and the key capabilities of Biocon as a brand, which helps them in a better understanding. So that's the kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, campaigns we do. 
Credibly Capable campaign was one such campaign we ran last year, and it had very effective uh, uh, kind of uh, engagement. Moving on to the Facebook campaigns, this is important, so I would want to talk about this before I conclude. Uh, as I said, you know, I mean, we engage with diverse stakeholders. So besides investors, it is very, very important to reach out to general public because ultimately, it's the patients who are who are uh, who have to benefit from the kind of research work that we do because whatever we are, um, you know, at Biocon, uh, there's this famous thing that we say that we are we are actually driven, we are very passionate, and we are driven by a passion to develop biopharmaceuticals which have the potential to benefit a billion patients. And that is what kind of drives us. And it's very, very important for us to engage with those patients and help them lead better, healthier life. And one of the ways to do that is to kind of sensitize them uh, and educate them about the various kind of um, you know, diseases that, that uh, you know, they have to deal with and how they can um, actually manage that disease better. So our programs are focused around diabetes, around cancer, chronic diseases, psoriasis, hepatitis, and we also, uh, you know, engage with uh, our potential employees and existing employees, and uh, employee communication is very, very important, and digital can really play a very crucial role when you're wanting to engage with your employees. Community engagement is, again, another very, very critical area. Most of the brands do that, and if you tell very compelling, interesting stories of the CSR work that you're doing on digital, it can really help in enhancing the reputation of the brand that you're representing. Um, some of the awards, so these are the basic things um, that you do. Uh, I, will, I had these slides, I will not show you what the global perspective on digital communication is, but I'll quickly go to the takeaways. Uh, one last minute, I've been told. Um, I wanted to check talk about how crisis can be managed using digital, but maybe for another time. Um, okay, so this uh, slide tells you about the misconceptions associated with reputation management on digital. Misconception one, many people are not talking about your company online, so it's all right. It's okay to ignore what is being said about you online, it shall pass. You don't need to respond to all customer reviews, it'll go away on its own. It's okay to respond angrily when a customer badmouths your company. He has no right to say anything about my company. You can control what others are saying about your business online. You just delete it. It's easy to cover up a negative online reputation. Just engage somebody on the SEO and he'll kill that for you. You need to have all five-star reviews. Your employees can't hurt your company's online reputation. But is that the truth? Not really. So let's do a reality check. So the reality check is that today you cannot ignore digital and social. Even if you are a pharma and healthcare brand, even if you are not a B2C and a lifestyle brand, you have to be there on digital and social. You have to start with listening and monitoring 24 by 7. Even if you're holding back and you're not engaging your brand on digital, you need to be there. You need to engage with diverse stakeholders, but you need to be honest in your communication. Time is of great essence. Your tone of communication is very, very critical when you are engaging online. But you also have to remember, you cannot control what others are saying, but you can definitely influence them. And influencing will happen with your true, concise, effective communication, the kind of messaging you use. And through effective digital communication strategy, you can actually enhance the brand value of your brand. It's all in your hands, it's all how you do it, and for that you need to first understand what your brand stands for. You need to have a brand persona and brand attributes line, outlined, which is what you need to use when communicating on digital. So what is it that we need to do? The brands need to engage using digital, build digital into the core business, speed is of a sense, look for innovation, build scalable models, and start with your leadership team. Get them on Twitter, get them on LinkedIn, get them to engage with stakeholders, and the rest will be very easy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sorry, it took a long time.
thank you very much, Seema. Uh, still so far, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, the perspective of media on healthcare. Here we got a perspective of the healthcare industry on how they utilize media. So, because she was talking about digital footprints, I mean, um, let me just uh, put up a few statistics for the audience here. I was going through certain researches, India abroad, and I kind of found out these figures that 40% of consumers search for health-related information today on social media. How many of you have health apps on your phones? I mean, you are from the medical fraternity, you'll be doubtful, at least we have. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, most of the popular health apps are about weight loss, diet, exercise. Uh, I, I'm sure half of the audience currently has this activity monitoring of how many steps you walk, walk in a day, the 10,000 step goal, yeah? I mean, I don't know how real it is, but um, the 10,000 steps dominate my day every day. Like, if I'm at 9, 5, 0, 0 at 12 o'clock in the night, I take the next 10 minutes to hit 10,000, because I can't sleep before that. That's how it kind of works. That's how it's kind of captured my mind. And I talk about it to a lot of other people who say they have similar, uh, you know, so to say, perceptions of what is fitness, what is health, and it is actually, is it actually constructed the right way? I come from a very different world. I, I am a trained journalist, right? Uh, I, I, I head the Symbiosis Institute of Media and Communication now, but but uh, more importantly, for me, the world that defines health or constructs health for me is the media that I refer to. You know, what is India known for? The two C's. Cricket, cinema. Yeah? How many of you have watched a Hindi film ever in your life? Show of hands, please. Fantastic. Great. We are Bollywood buffs, right? So have you watched a film called Amar Akbar Anthony? Okay, the late Vinod Khanna. This is not a condolence session for him. but. There is something so great about these films that they have just got embedded in our mind. There are certain images about medical information that we just seem to forget. Yeah? Okay, let us, let us like, visualize a couple of scenes, okay? So there's a woman who collapses. She's carried to the bed where she's lying unconscious. The doctor is called. Everyone in the house is so worried, tense. They all gather around the bedside. What happens? The doctor is like a magician touches the pulse, right, and says, don't worry, she's going to be a mother. <laughs> no date for the last menstrual period, right, no pregnancy test, it's only Bollywood style best pregnancy test. Okay, just visualize another situation, another situation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have grown up on it, I kind of understood it pretty late that you have to, when I actually <laughs> got pregnant possibly. Yeah, but let's go to the second situation. Uh, so there's this woman, usually newly married, Hindi film, right? There is a house, there are people around, and she suddenly feels sick and starts running to the sink, and she vomits, right? <laughs> so she vomits there, and when she vomits, uh, everybody, especially the male members of the house, get very panicked. And then there is this knowledgeable elderly woman in the family, <laughs> usually the mother-in-law, who just looks and says that, don't worry, good news, right? <laughs> She's going to be a mother. Well, um, what I'm trying to say is that these are glaring examples from our films about how they mishandle medical information, right? Though there are great examples, great examples like Koshish, Sanjeev Kumar, Jaya Bachchan. Uh, a great example from a very contemporary film like Tare Zameepar, which talks about a disease from a very social perspective, right? But these examples are few and far between. So, because films have such an impact, they have such a strong the audiovisual medium can have such an impact. Why is it that for healthcare campaigning, we haven't been able to utilize it in a certain way? You know, we have certain powerful health campaigns also, but we haven't been able to actually understand the impact that they have managed to have. So let's think about uh, a scenario. Uh, so what we've tried to do is, we have tried to put up an AV here, which is a 10 minute short video of good and bad health campaigns. Now, whether they are good and bad, the perception would be yours, right? But we try to have a combination of messages, and once we screen that video, we like to open the house for a discussion, get a few questions from you, and get the expert opinion from our August speakers here at the stage to understand how best to utilize this medium. The only problem is this video is in cinema spoke, scope. Uh, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. Can we play the video, please? Thank you.
like to open the discussion with the audience now. Please feel free to ask your questions from the speakers here. And uh, any other reflections or any other subject that you may want us to talk about, you're more than welcome to ask those questions. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, conference. And uh, my name is Sarita Rai. I'm a postgraduate st uh, student of hospital management. Uh, my question is uh, to Ms. Shushma Kapoor and Dr. Pradeep, sir, uh, for providing awareness and education to the needy people. Uh, there is a barrier which comes, uh, like a barrier of shyness, hesita hesitation, and taboo in our society. So how we can overcome it? Like there are so many issues related to uh, sexual issues and uh, women were facing many issues and mental issues in, um, uh, in rural areas, which is not like we don't talk about it openly. So how we can overcome it in a society? My question is this. Thank you. Uh, yes, there are several kinds of barriers, and I'll specifically refer to taboo barriers, you know. Um, I think it is important uh, that these barriers, uh, that the taboo barrier is discussed, you know, in small groups uh, among people who really matter. For example, you know, if it's a question of, let's say, um, if it's a question, let's say, of menstruation, you know, it is better that, you know, this is discussed among small group of, you know, um, adolescent girls so that this can be, you know, so that, you know, it can be practiced. The important point is that it should not be discussed in hush-hush manner. Now, there must be uh, a forum where this can be discussed. And I think this is, as far as menstruation is concerned, it is getting addressed in schools and other places. Uh, so the important thing is, as I said, you know, that it is important to discuss it in small groups. And um, the other option, of course, is that, you know, put it out there in the open for example, in the media, so that people can start th thinking about this, can start talking about this. So I think media can play a very important role, interpersonal communication can play a very important role, group discussion, small group discussions can play an important role. And if you can, um, there are other devices that are usually used in such kind of campaigns. You can get a celebrity, celebrity you know, get in, uh, uh, you can involve a celebrity into this. You can put it in the curriculum. Uh, you have in schools, you know, um, social workers, et cetera, et cetera, who are part of the school system. So there are social mechanisms through which it can be discussed. Uh, parents actually uh, are a major barrier because they wouldn't want to discuss this. And if you can target parents as well, because that's, it's, it's based, several of these taboos are related to, you know, the social structure or the family structure itself. So it is important that these discussed in, uh, are discussed in the family itself. And one way of do, doing this is to, you know, get celebrity endorsement or advertising, you know, that comes on television and other things to discuss these things. So I think it, over a period of time, you know, there can be some of these taboos can get actually, you know, reduced if not completely eliminated. Yeah, uh, I think Dr. Pradeep has sort of summed it up very, very nicely, all the various uh, actions that can be taken. Uh, we saw in some of the films that television can have a very wide reach even uh, in, in rural areas and we do need to open up these subjects uh, for, as Dr. Pradeep very rightly said, not as a hush-hush topic but something that is part of, of uh, you know, everybody's body. It's, and it's, it cannot be that because these are women's issues they need to be uh, not be discussed openly. It is very important that we also bring in the men in these conversations. Sure, sure. So male Im involvement, whether it is, and that film said it very nicely, uh, whether it is uh, deciding on the spacing of your child or the kind of uh, method you will use for contraception, it is so important to involve the men, uh, the male members of the family, the husband, and uh, 
again, I think Dr. Ruchi said it, the mother-in-law is also very, very important <laughs> because uh, <laughs> um, a lot of the decisions still get taken sure. by her. But uh, talking about women, I think, we, yes, uh, it is very important to now begin to talk to our adol adolescents. Sure. We cannot hide away from these subjects. The, the, the social media is giving enough information to everybody. So we cannot be in that environment where we say, oh no, we cannot talk about this in our schools. We don't need to, or, or parents, as, as Dr. Pradeep said, we have to be so right. much more open. Right, and if I may add, brands need to reinvent themselves. They cannot any longer call themselves whisper, right? Because it's nothing to be whispered about, yeah? So, so your question. Yes. I am Dr. Heman Sant. I am consultant of preventive oncology in HCG Cancer Hospital, Vadodara. My question is, in the new generation where t Twitter has restricted us to 140 words. Characters. Characters. <laughs> where time span of the audience is so less and it is decreasing, should we not give crisp right messages from experts like we have been using so much words? But like iron deficiency, nobody says that why to take, woman should take iron tablet. Answer is, no palak, no beet, no gajar or all idiotic things gives you iron. So content in the health community, I'll give you the example, Mr. Ketkar, who is a great journalist said that I do not differentiate between a doctor, the science and art of medicine and a tantric or a mantric. So we health communicators have failed them. My question is that we should use crisp, scientific and right messages in the right time and not blame the media. Don't discuss the effect. But what is the root cause analysis? I appeal to you. Sure. Would you like to respond to that, Dr. Subarao, Seema? I think it was a point Thank that you. he was making. Um, yeah, I think you, you've made a very valid point there that in today's era we need to be very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, mindful of the kind of tone and the language we use and yes, precise communication is very, very important, which is what I did refer to when I said that the digital does allow you, give you that opportunity to connect with the audience with a very clear, precise, effective, transparent communication. And I think uh, what Dr. Subara was talking about, the media, the traditional media piece was that uh, you know, they still need to be educated enough. I don't think we were blaming them. We were only saying that, yeah, that there is more, t more expected out of them. You want to add that? Yeah, I mean, uh, we are in a different context in India, unlike in many other cultures. See, we, uh, for any health, uh, health counseling or health related information, we just don't fall back on uh, Twitter or social media. We also talk to our neighbors, we talk to tantrics, we talk to everybody. <laughs> so all these coexist in Indian context. Yeah, crisp messaging is very important, but people look at remedies. And uh, the iron deficiency anemia that you're talking about, I do agree that there is issue with bioavailability of iron in, in vegetable sources. People should be talked about uh, taking supplements and other things. It has to be really crisp. There's, there is no argument on that. What we were trying to say is why this is happening. I was not trying to blame the media, but n nor Dr. Kitkar. We were only trying to say why there is a disconnect between what is to be communicated and what is being communicated and what is being perceived. That's we are trying to assess this. The moment these are assessed, I think your, your suggestion can be implemented better and more easily. Sure. So that's what we uh, Thank you. intend to say. Uh, do we have I'm uh, <laughs> myself, myself, Dr. Pankaj Bansal. I am Professor Maxillofacial Surgery. Uh, see what we have listened in last three hours or so. Uh, what I conclude is that there are three things that is perception, ignorance and perception at right, right perspective. Yeah. Now the problem comes is how do perception get made in people's mind? Perception get made by media. So there is every way that we should blame media. Blame is not a word. Blame is not a word that should not be spoken at any end. We should blame media. But the main important thing is that why media does so? Media does so because they themselves are not informed. And why they are not informed? Because health education information system doesn't exist in our systems. Why can't we start at school level? We are going on teaching algebra equations, square root, under root, and 
a cube root of everything that hardly comes into play for more than 1% of population <laughs> and health education that comes day in and day out. And not, I can tell you that not even 10% of the population that is sitting here knows that what is the source of which vitamin comes from which place and what should be done as a primary care if a person get accident and on roadside, what is ABC or BCA, what comes first. Shouldn't those be taught before the uh, person is in fifth class and what all ICMR and other, uh, uh, Ms. Sashi, this pressure group can do to incorporate in government policies these things. I, I don't think uh, any move has been made before that. Sure. Uh, would you like to respond to that? I, I completely agree with you. See this, uh, I've been arguing for quite some time that, uh, I mean I work in the area of nutrition, education, communication with adolescents and school going children a lot. And then we've been, I've been arguing for a fact that we should stop teaching nutrition or health as an academic curriculum. It should be a skill building activity. There's a lot of difference. You know, when it comes to 